our brains tell us that objects on the horizon are smaller. In this case, our brains are wrong. Do you see red, green, and blue stripes of color on this spinning wheel? Excellent. Your brain has just fooled you again. OK, now watch what happens. I'm going to turn it off, and you can see what it really is. Oh, uh, it's black and white. How does it do that? <laughs> well, good question. And Nobody, the good answer is? <laughs> nobody's quite sure. You need a wheel that's half black and half white. And on the white, you need these black lines that kind of interrupt the white. And it, when it spins, it creates like pulses of light that come to your eye. And for some reason, your eye brain system interprets those pulses as color. I think I'm getting hypnotized. <laughs> Sally, I've seen this exhibit, and I know what's going on here, but I still can't believe that my poor little brain is this easily fooled. Well, what do you see? Well, I see one it? white piece of paper with a tail down the middle. And if you move the tail? There's an edge there. Yeah. Well, this is actually a really good demonstration of how important edges are for your eye to make a distinction between things that are lighter and darker. But how can I be so easily fooled when those are so different in color? Well, actually, there's another part to this illusion that enhances it. I knew there had to be. <laughs> These two squares are identical, they but are. they're not uniform. So it gradually gets from light to dark. It's light on the left, and it gradually gets darker. So like at this edge right here, this gray right here is as dark as this gray over here. Really? So use this card here, and I'll hold, hold the that. tail. And now look at those two grays. I can prove it, but I can't figure it out. <laughs> Seeing isn't always believing. And nowhere is that more true than on the other side of the looking glass. This is a great illusion that's caused by mirrors. And what this thing is we're looking at is a piece of glass that actually has a lot of silver in it, and so or chrome. So it acts like a mirror, too. So I can see myself, but I can also see you on the other side. So if we sit the same distance from this piece of glass, we're both inside the mirror, and our faces blend. Right. Very weird. Push the button. See what happens. Ah! <laughs> it's half and half. <laughs> Actually, we don't. That's, we line up pretty good. We line up pretty good. Kind of We're weird, the same person. <laughs> one brown eye and one blue, and this weird distorted mouth. But... In learning about vision, we've come to understand that seeing really lies in the mind's eye. Back in the audience now for our next question. This time it comes from? Irma McDearman. You had a good question. Why don't you tell everybody what it was? What happens when I lose my voice? Do you lose it often? Quite often. Yeah, yeah. all right. Well, we're going to find out what you can do about it. Here to answer that question is Dr. Jan Seary, our biologist from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Good to see you again, Jan. Thanks, Ira. <laughs> oh, no. Do we have to say goodbye already? <laughs> <laughs> no. You're not really. You're no, not... I don't really but, am. <laughs> well, what happens when you lose your voice? Well, in order to talk about what happens when you lose your voice, we need to talk about how you generate mm. your voice. And I brought the larynx. That's why it's called laryngitis. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you were to look inside the larynx, um, what you see is it sort of sits on the top of the trachea, the windpipe, and air will come up from the lungs, and it will pass between two structures, the vocal folds, and they're right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, these vocal folds will 
come very, very tightly together when you're talking, and air will squeeze in between them, and as it goes in between, that causes them to vibrate, and that buzz will generate your voice. Well, those are the vocal cords. Yes, you that's right. Fold that's sometimes. right. Uh -huh. Well, what happens to the vocal cords that actually make you lose your voice? Okay, well, normally the uh, vocal cords are ligaments, two ligaments, covered over by a membrane. And there's a little water in there, but not very much. They're pretty thin, actually. Mm -hmm. So the air can really get them to vibrate. And that's like this lower model we have of, of some pink balloons. And you can hear oh. it when they vibrate, yeah, they, make they make noise. noise. Okay. Yeah. Now, when these vocal folds take on water, then they become heavier and thicker, and it's a little harder for the air to get through and make them buzz. And also, they vibrate at a lower frequency, so your voice starts to drop. Right, gets right. It sounds actually better when you. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and then, if they continue to swell, then you lose your voice altogether, like these red. Oh, they really they, can't. You, they don't make any sound. No, they at don't all. make any sound. Mm -mm. But well, you know, this is a this is a real problem, isn't it? You're oh not, yeah, it is. But what can you do about <laughs> that? I mean, what's there? What? Well, you can do several things about it. Um, you, the the best thing to do is rest because the reason that you get laryngitis is because the area is inflamed mm -hmm. and it can be inflamed for several reasons one is because like if you get a sprained ankle your ankle is inflamed okay right. and it swells okay in response to that and the cord will swell then if you um, if you overdo it, right. if you uh, like yell, yell for a long period or, of time or something yeah. and just overdo it and abuse it, it will uh, become inflamed. Another way that it will become inflamed is if you have an infection, like a cold or something, and the, vi and the viruses or bacteria will come and inflame the area. And uh, usually uh, those sorts of things will be alleviated if you just just rest. just rest. So you don't have to take any sort of medication in most cases? and No. There's no, nothing really much to, helps. But you have to rest your voice, not you. That, that helps the most. And just whisper. Oh, whisper. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you, Jan, for that swell demonstration. And now for our next segment, which may leave you speechless. <laughs> New cars getting bigger and parking spaces getting smaller, at Piedmont, California, an inventor has developed something to soothe the motorist's headache by putting the spare tire to work. He calls this device the park car and says it can be installed on any model. Watch how it works. Taking power from the drive shaft, the spare tire swings the rear end into the clear. Then he just retracts the spare, backs into the street, and away we go. It's handy for parking in inaccessible garages, too. Here's a narrow driveway, but with the spare tire put to work, the car can turn a complete circle in its own radius, and parking is simple indeed. Even the worst driver can make the garage without denting a fender with the aid of fifth-wheel driving. Automation enters the nursery in this playful prediction from Budapest. One nurse at a central control panel will be able to manage a whole brigade of babies, and the tykes will spend happily antiseptic infancies untouched by human hands. They'll even be tucked into their cribs by remote control. Bringing up baby by push button, a grandiose conception indeed. But there's one flaw apparent in this brave new world. After the bottle, how are they going to burp him? Of course, there really is no ocean here. What we have is a hollow chamber of air that resonates with the passing wind. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Let me get a cutaway of a shell here. May I have one? Thank you. Thank you very much. As you can see, when we cut open the shell, what do we have? We have a long, hollow, air-filled cavity inside. Now, what happens? Well, when sounds come by the opening of the cavity, or when wind blows across the opening of the cavity, noise from your room, noise from the ocean here, they start vibrating the in, on the inside. Now, depending on how much air is inside, depending on the size of the cavity, that will determine 
the pitch, the frequency of the sound that you hear in your ear. In other words, a large cavity will produce a lower tone, a small cavity will produce a higher tone. And this cavity will select out those tones from all the tones that are bouncing around the environment. Now, if you have a wind that changes its, its intensity, if it blows hard and then blows soft, or if you have noises that become loud and become soft, what do they sound like? To your mind, they sound like crashing waves. And that's why when you put this up to your ear and you hear the change in sound, you think, gee, I must be at the beach. I must be hearing the sound of the ocean inside the shell. This will happen any time you have a hollow air-filled cavity. So if you haven't got a shell to listen to, look, look around. Whoop. What's this? Fan mail from a flounder? Please send help. Would you take care of that right away? Thank you. Hollow chamber filled with air. Of course, if you don't have a shell and you want to hear the ocean, just stick this in your ear. I'm sure you've noticed that when walking along the beach, the footprints you leave behind turn white. But I'll bet you didn't know why. You know, common sense says that the reason they turn white is because your feet are compacting the sand. But really, just the opposite is happening. Let me show you. The sand is already as compact as it's going to get. Your foot cannot compact it anymore. What your foot can do is disrupt it. See, it turns white when you push very hard on it because the sand rises above the water. It's not as wet as the sand in the water, so it's whiter. And this is why you leave a footprint in the sand. Now, the footprint remains white in the sand until capillary action draws water back up into the sand, making the sand wet again and turning it the same color as the rest of the sand. Or a wave comes by and washes it away. One more thing. At the beach, you certainly don't have to worry about leaving telltale footprints. But it's interesting to note that just as there are no two sets of fingerprints alike, no two sets of footprints are the same. So why don't detectives use footprint identification? Well, they do occasionally. The problem is that most people's footprints are difficult to classify because the skin on the bottom of the feet is in such poor condition. Also, fingerprinting is significantly easier and probably a lot more pleasant than the footprinting alternative.